Hello, thank you for tuning in to the Planet of the Courageous. I'm Dr. Dean Nelson, host of Planet of the Courageous. This planet is spinning and hurling through space at 67,000 miles per hour. It takes courage to not slip into fear and collapse into anxiety, and one can find many justifications now for selfishness and prejudice. But we do have two ears to listen to one another, and we have one heart that can provide a common ground, but this takes courage. We chose the right planet for the opportunity to learn courage and try to solve so many challenges. Today, I get the delight to interview a friend, David Butts, a member of a slightly maligned profession as of late. He's been a career journalist and is presently the business editor for the Honolulu Star Advertiser. Previously, he worked in Japan from 1985 to 1998, first as a Tokyo bureau chief and later managing editor for Bloomberg News in Asia. In this job, he managed and built the area staff from five to 150 reporters, covering 18 different locations. On a personal note, he met his wife, Kazio, while in Japan and has been married for 37 years. He has two stunning sons and two way above average grandchildren. As a friend, I know David to be a man of high professional integrity and success, but I'm suspicious that he may rate playing with his granddaughter and being in the ocean as a higher calling even than his work. Aloha, David. Thank you for coming on. Hello, Dean. Thank you for having me. Okay, you're not going to start chewing gum and start yelling at me right away here, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get the back to that I'll later. get back to that later. I hope and you I, get the reference. I also need to... Um, Cover this. You're not. You don't work for one of those false news channels or stations, do you? This is. Uh, you work for a real news station, a re <laughs> real news newspaper. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> What's your answer? You read the Star Advertiser. <laughs> I work for the Honolulu Star Advertiser. Yeah. And the readers get to judge whether we're false news or real news. Yes. Yeah. I would say. Mm-hmm. You know, speak of the mechanics, though. You've, uh, you've spoken at times of news agencies, newspapers that you really feel are high in integrity. You've mentioned the New York Times to me. You've mentioned BBS. Um, walk through the mechanics of how news gets reported and how uh, the spin on it at least gets diminished. Well... <clears throat> Spin is an interesting question, of course, mm -hmm. and that gets to the point of objectivity. Um, but for the most part, what you're looking for in a news organization, what you're looking for when you hear anything new to you mm -hmm. is what's the source. And, um, you know, if it's a source that you can believe, if it's, and generally speaking, I think we can believe when the New York Times reports something, when the Washington Post reports something, when Breitbart News reports something, I think you have to go back a little further and see where they got it from um, and keep your eyes open on that. I hope that the Honolulu Star Advertiser has won the trust of most of the readers mm. and they can believe where we're getting our news. Uh, when we hear information, when I'm on the desk at the advertiser and a reporter comes to me and says they've got this new information, uh -huh, right. the first thing I say is where did it come from? Okay. And then you want to question the credibility of that source and then you want to question the motives of that source mm -hmm. because it could be coming from the governor's office, it could be coming from a respected organization, but they could have an ax to grind, they could have a dog in the fight, mm -hmm. and they're just pushing this information forward to project their point of view, mm -hmm. in which case we may not choose to reprint that bit of information. And so what are the checks and balances? It comes to you, it gets bounced up, it gets bounced around, it gets uh, leaned into, it gets... Well, we do, you generally, at, at our newspaper and most across the country, the reporters are the line of contact with the community. Mm -hmm. And when they bring us a story, they bring it to the editors. I'm the business editor. Mm -hmm. Then above me, there's a managing editor. And then there's okay. the editor, Frank Bridgewater. And if there's a question about the credibility of the, of the story, I'll take it up to my managing editor and I'll take it to the editor and we'll discuss it and we'll talk about it with the reporter mm -hmm. and we will 
do our best to verify that it's true and that the person presenting the information isn't doing so just uh, to benefit themselves mm -hmm. um, or to sway public opinion. Although that does happen quite a bit, of course, so they have some interest in presenting it. Mm -hmm. But um, there's a process to go through um, and generally we think that's pretty solid. Mm -hmm. uh, then if we make a mistake, the um, process at the advertiser is to correct it. We have a space on page B2 every yeah. day that runs corrections. Right. We try to correct them as fast and completely as possible. You know, you've been in this your whole life. I mean, right now, how does it feel, like, literally as a human to, and also as a reporter, to be told to kind of shut up and listen right now? Or uh, that it's you know, kind of a, you've been maligned that uh, you're not really reporting truth, you're reporting uh, <laughs> a constant spin or a constant half-truth. Yeah, well, it's going to be... You know, it, there's actually a, a White House now that's actually saying we get to say what the truth is and, and you fall in line behind that. I mean, there's... Yeah, they're there's actually some, saying that. That's Ignore what, that's the media and just take what the White House tells you. That, that's a little frightening. It's it? extremely frightening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's up to the public to make that decision. Mm -hmm. Do they want to just listen to the White House or do they want to listen to the news sources that have hopefully won their trust over the yeah. years? There's two things that, that spin off for me or that make me think. One, one is kind of <clears throat> how fear is sold and how that fear itself kind of works against an intelligent examination of viewpoints or of facts altogether. It just makes you kind of what's called reptilian brain. And the other one that I would kind of like to hear you speak about is, I actually want to kind of quote the Dalai Lama. It has to do with responsibility of what's, what you call the fourth estate, the free press being the fourth estate of a democracy, this fabulous experiment that we get to live in. So I want to quote on that. He, he wrote that the power of the media is a real power which acts on us directly or indirectly and modifies your behavior, tastes, and probably our thinking. Like any authority, it can be applied at random. It gives journalists a responsibility comparable to religious and political leaders. In their way, they are contributing to the establishment and maintenance of a human community. And the well-being of that community should be their first concern. In light of that and the principles of journalism, he talked about the responsibility of the, of the press. I, mean, I would love to right. hear you speak about that. <clears throat> well, it is a very interesting time to be a journalist. It's a very interesting time to be a consumer of news. It's important. I mean, we have a president who's challenging the news, um, the fourth estate, and mm -hmm. trying to get people to ignore it. Um, and it is becomes, as your quote mentioned, it's the responsibility of the reporters, the editors, the news organizations mm -hmm. to deliver daily the information that people can trust and verify mm -hmm. and balance what's happening elsewhere mm -hmm. and offer the context. When you talk about the responsibility of the media, um, the responsibility basically is to report accurately and fairly, uh -huh. to put it in context. Fear has always been, uh, you mentioned the media using fear uh, or the media profiting from fear. Um, yeah, I and think that has to be explored. That could be the case. I mean, uh -huh. the, certainly more people are paying attention to the news now uh -huh. than they were before uh, uh -huh. Trump was elected. Um, and um, you could say they're profiting from fear, but the responsibility of journalists is to put it into context and to make people understand what is uh, really a danger and how it ranks. I mean, is, you know, you take a local story like um, Genki Sushi and the hepatitis A right, outbreak. Right, 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 right. If you play that up big uh -huh. and it can scare people right. and people stop right. eating sushi right. all over, right. <laughs> all over right. the town, right. or you can balance it with a little context, um, the number of people that got sick, how often this happens, what Genki Sushi and other people are doing to mm -hmm. uh, prevent it from going any further. Um, to assure people that 
it's not a danger that they are imminently uh, threatened with hepatitis A. Right, so we're back again, a responsibility to the community, to uplift the community. And that's, a, that's kind right. of like a, a calling, you could almost say. I mean, do you see yourself in that sense, trying to uplift the community? That it's actually a conscious thing of not letting the society degrade into reptilian reactive brain, so to speak. <laughs> um, well, I, I'm not sure the responsibility of the media goes quite that far. I, I mean, we provide the information. We want to provide credible information. Mm -hmm. And um, we want to provide, <clears throat> and I do believe it's a positive force in society. I certainly believe that's the case. I take another local issue. There was the next era's attempt to buy right. Hawaiian Electric mm -hmm. Industries. Yes, right. And the advertiser put a reporter almost full time mm -hmm. on that story while it was going on, mm -hmm. who did a lot of reporting on what Nextera did in Florida. Yeah, what was and the how, I remember um, that quite well. Yeah, mm -hmm. and how limited the um, use of rooftop solar, for right. example, right. is in the mm -hmm. Nextera coverage area in Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, we exposed a lot, and I I believe it helped um, add to the discussion that was going oh, well, on at was the time. A good, a good community investment, you could say. Yeah. We did the same with rail early on mm -hmm. with rail, mm -hmm. the early coverage out of the advertiser discussed a lot of the issues that are still coming up now, mm -hmm. whether it should be elevated or on mm -hmm. grade, the cost. Sandwich Isles, another example of good reporting that we've done um, to expose uh, a group that was. Um, taking money from the government and basically uh, using it for personal reasons. Again, let's, let's go into the um, kind of we versus them or the kind of split in the um, news altogether that we're listening to two different sources. Um, by that I mean I'm, I'm wondering if it's almost as a citizen responsible to, to spread where we're getting our news sources from. We should almost be obligated to watch a little CNN, obligated to watch a little Fox, obligated to read a little newspaper, because it just seems like the, the, um, the different news stations are actually just keep preaching to their choir, to their church members, and we aren't literally not hearing each other's news. We're not hearing each other's facts or the approach. How, again, how do you see the news media and helping that discussion of listening, of actually not being threatened by some other's point of view. Right. <clears throat> well, that, yeah, it's interesting you mention that because uh, that's the job of the media, uh, the, is to present all points of view. That's mm -hmm. why if you look at our um, editorial page, you know, we have the um, op-eds written by um, people who oppose favor every issue yeah, that we come across. So wonderful, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And the idea is we want to be inclusive and we want to listen to the other points of views, the stories that we write. We want to interview mm -hmm. all sides that have an interest in the story and present the best arguments that they have. We don't want to cheat them. Um, mm -hmm. And that is that is what we do. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, this is a good start on what we're going to chat about today. I, I'm just told we've got to go away for a break. Thank you. Yeah. Aloha Kako, I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to navigate the journey with us. We are here every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. and we really want you to be with us where we look at the options and choices of end-of-life care. Aloha. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ted Ralston. You know, Ted is the uh, host of uh, Where the Road Leads. It shows uh, every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. It's about technology. It's about how people collaborating and solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there, 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Aloha. Good. 
you know, I want to return to that listening uh, skill set that we seem to need as a country in order to move forward right now, the polarization that's happening in our country, and not just the sense that one person's getting information from this source, one person's getting the information from that source, but also almost the obligation to get it from another source and to actually drop down. We have two ears, we have one heart, and we can actually kind of relate to one another and, and listen. On the other hand, I heard, a, I did watch a 60 Minutes piece before the election, and it was a very, very skilled survey taker. And one of the things that he pointed out was just how reactionary anybody is. It's almost like two words don't get out of one's mouth before you're conjuring how smart you're going to put that other person down. Again, I just want you to kind of elaborate on how everything can be toned down a little bit and communication can be toned up, understanding, listening to other can be toned up. How, how could the media help with that? Well, uh, of course, in the media, it, it's reflected in the balance of stories, uh, the balance of editorials and editorial pages, mm -hmm. um, the balance of the story selection and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it has, you know, you've seen with Fox News and with MSNBC, the success of media that speak to one group that basically favor wow. one point of view. Mm -hmm. And and then you as the viewer can switch from one to the other and try to get different points of view. Mm -hmm. And then CNN tries to stick to a more balanced view, um, CBS, NBC, uh, the more traditional news sources do that. I think what you were talking about really the, goes beyond the news media. Um, the in our personal lives, you know, if we have if all of our friends are the same political view, who mm -hmm. look like us, mm -hmm. who think like us, right. who have the same views like we do, right? And when we meet somebody who doesn't, mm -hmm. we kind of let them drop off of our list of friends, right? Uh, to maintain that is a real Disservice. Sad. Yeah, disservice to this great occurrence. experiment. Yeah. Right. yeah, it is. Uh, you know, if you're not um, including others and listening to others mm -hmm. and finding the common ground you have with others, even though you may disagree on political issues or whatever it might be, um, uh, you're, there's really little hope that we'll pull it all together. But you must be trained somewhat in that as a reporter. You're trained to not get blown away by... You know, there's some part, I've watched you in discussions where you, you filter information real quickly and come back with a prodding question that kind of opens things up. There must be some training that you actually have in that. <laughs> well, um, through interviewing a lot of different people, and, uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> and, you know, some of them, let's say if I were to interview somebody who's building a nuclear power plant, mm -hmm. and I'm not generally in favor of nuclear power plants, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I can see mm -hmm what their understanding of their purpose in life is. Okay. I can see that they've been brought into it. Maybe they're just making a lot of money off of it, and that's the main thing, but usually it's not. Usually they have a real belief in what they're doing. But you're saying you see their point of view. I see their point of view. You yeah. get in their shoes. Exactly. Before you don't get in their exactly. shoes. Exactly. I remember do, um, interviewing the developer of the houses in uh, Eva Beach uh -huh. once, and I really am not a fan of, a that. Fan of all the yeah. housing going on right. on farmland in Eva Beach or the general area. Mm -hmm. uh, but I could definitely feel the intensity, the integrity of the person of the who is building them right. and understand where he's coming from. He, people want his point of view was, it's the American dream. Are you going to deny that? To have how? <laughs> yeah. But you could see their intensity. You could see their integrity. You could see their logic. You weren't threatened by it. Right. It was okay to listen to this. You may not still be a fan of uh, a lot of houses on Eva Beach Plain, but there was some sense of communication going on that didn't just turn into a tussle, you could say. It. Right. It's a lot more valuable for us to find, you know, we're all human and where we... Common ground, common heart. Exactly. Open what we ears. share rather than what we differ in. There's another thing I kind of wanted a chance to talk to you about, and that's <clears throat> the broad sweep that's going on in terms of newspapers just not being where we're going to get our news. For instance, you said something about the New York Times and, you know, the, the amount of integrity it and the Post have. 
if they aren't selling newspapers, how do they have the money to actually do the checking, to do the facts, to do the reporting, to get people out there actually pounding on doors and saying, is this true? Do you see this as a, a factor in our news right now? Is uh, Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, it's the number one threat greater than Trump, the Trump administration <laughs> to the news media right now is the, um, the death of newspapers, uh, the slow death of newspapers around the country uh, because of advertising shifting to online and mm -hmm. then shifting to the mm -hmm. major online advertisers, Google and Facebook, not to the local newspaper mm -hmm. as an advertiser. Mm -hmm. um, it's a threat to the television media. Mm -hmm. uh, so all these people that have over the past decades been providing news are no longer able to make a living at it, at least not in the numbers that they were before. Um, and that's caused a big drop in the number of journalists. In this city, you can see, um, you know, we went down from two newspapers to one. So move, move me forward on this one. Now, this isn't going to go away. I mean, the, no. the Internet's not going to go away. We've got some, it seems like, somewhat responsible uh, media, uh, internet, um, advertise, I'm sorry, uh, news agencies, like I think Marketplace is doing a pretty good job, but they, they, they almost unabashedly are also saying they're coming from a point of view. Mike is seemingly doing some good things. Tell, how do you see what's going to come down, how they're going to have the money to do the checks and balances, pay their people, pay their staff? I mean, it all runs somewhat on uh, enough money to do this. So it absolutely give does. Me a, give me a view of this thing. What do you see coming down? Unless you want to have a bunch of um, independently wealthy people as journalists, <laughs> you have to or, or, find a business model where you can pay journalists to do their job. And everybody's searching for that business model right now. Okay. One of them is um, to have uh, subscribers, direct mm -hmm. subscribers to the news that you right, put out. Right, right, One right. of them is philanthropy, to have a wealthy um, Jeff Bezos of Amazon bought the Washington Post, and he'll keep it going longer than probably somebody who needed to make money off of the Washington Post. Um, yeah. You know, Pierre Omidyar uh -huh. started Civil Beat, and he'll keep it going as, um, pr probably as long as he can, uh, as long as he wants to. Uh, so there's a search for the correct model, for the new model that will result in uh, credible journalism continuing. And there is a little bit of issue there, follow the money, whether that be advertising now or a philanthropist who can afford to see that the news comes out. There still is a objectivity that you're going to have to challenge on some sense. Right, and you'll have, following the money is important, mm -hmm. and it, and you need to do that. Uh, it it was also the case with newspapers, you know, they they have advertisers, and it's um, often the case that newspapers won't attack their largest advertisers. Right. So you know right. you have right, to right, right. the the philanthropist that's paying for. Uh, news mm -hmm. is probably not going to be attacked in his own news service. Right. Um, so you have to judge. Again, it goes back to what I said at the very beginning. When you hear news, ask where it came from and ask the motives of the person who gave it to you. And I'm also going to underline, uh, I think a beautiful point is see it from that person's integrity or point of view. It just seems like that's part of the lesson that we need to learn as a, as a culture right now is to actually get less reactive, re less fear and reptilian brain and actually lean into, oh, I'm curious about you, lean into curiosity. That seems to be one of the things you bring to the table as a reporter all the time. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, if you just um, discount as um, not credible everybody who you don't believe, who yeah. doesn't follow your point of view. Right. Um, they're stupid, they're this, they're this, they're almost like a third grade name calling kind of thing. It's just not benefiting us now. Right. right. You, you're going to die of loneliness. <laughs> Speaking of loneliness, now, <laughs> let me spin another way or go another direction. I guess spin's my favorite word to say. <laughs> you're 60 years old in Chinese medicine, I, ha I, was, I have helped you uh, celebrate your birthday. In Chinese medicine, Thank at you. 60 years, you've been through 12 of the zodiac signs, the 12 animals, and you've been through five elemental influences on those 12. 
I'm kind of curious now. How, how are you looking back on life? What do, what do you see as a man, as as a career, as a making a very successful career of having good life? Share some personal thoughts about what it is right now to be a man. Well, I appreciate my friendship with you, Dean, and the fact that you are a thinking, sensitive, feeling man. And that's a rare animal in, in our culture. Most men are trying to mimic what they see on uh, TV. They're going to the think strong, I set you up on this here. <laughs> uh, you didn't the set strong, me up on this. The strong, but, silent type. Men don't wear pink. Men don't cry. Men don't feel. Men don't think. Men right. don't hurt. Men don't exactly. Except fill in the blank, right? And if, uh, in the, so if there's one thing I've learned in 60 years, it's to give that up <laughs> and to accept that heavy, we are feeling heavy human burden. beings yeah. and it's important to acknowledge it and mm. discuss it and be open to it and uh, don't wait until the last couple of weeks before you die to decide you want to have a real relationship with people. Can you just think of how much is lost by men not being willing to really be soft and open their hearts? and? We're, we're kind of designed to pretend we know everything. <laughs> News <Yeah>. flash. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> or run the other direction if it starts, if the conversation starts with feelings. Yeah. What? Yeah, that's a real shame. Give me your favorite Hawaiian saying. Aloha. Yeah. How come, my friend? Can't beat love. Hello. Goodbye. Mm. Breath. Mm. It's got. It's got it all. All-encompassing. Uh -huh. I love it as a sign-off on emails, and yeah. you can use it in almost every occasion. Yeah. David, I want to thank you so much for being on the show and sharing the depth now of just from a professional point of view, but allowing us to go also go into some depth about what it is to be a human being and to awaken and try to benefit our societies. I'm going to sign off. i saying the same sign-off that I have. Be kind, be courageous, do some good, and mostly also have fun. So thank you so much for tuning in, and much aloha. I look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks. Aloha.